excited to get back into the Word of God. Perry was telling that story. And, uh, you know, we, we never know what we'll face for our faith, do we? I hope I would never face what that Indian chief faced. I just, I could not imagine. So, uh, I just thank God that I've never been placed in that place. I pray the Lord gives us opportunity, our families, my family, just to continue to grow with the grace and knowledge of Jesus and to present the gospel. Amen. I want to look back uh, just a little bit, not a great deal, because sometimes redundance can become uh, uh, a key to, to uh, making us uh, kind of feel like reaction and not learning more. So I don't want to be, spend a great deal on that, what we've looked at, but I do want to look at this for a few moments. And uh, could I, I won't read the whole chapter, but I'd like to read this chapter a little differently to you this evening, if I may, uh, at least several verses. We'll see how it flows and if I feel like I should read the whole thing. But I want you to listen. I'm going to change things up a little bit for you, all right? So listen with your ears, and not only with your ears, but with your hearts. And uh, tell me what you think. <coughs> Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not Jesus, I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Though I have uh, the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge and have all faith that I can remove mountains and I have not Jesus, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not Jesus, it profits me nothing. Jesus suffers long and is kind. Jesus envies not. Jesus vots not himself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave himself unseemingly. Seeks not his own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Jesus never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there shall be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For now we know a part, we prophesy a part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is a part shall be done away. When I, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. And I understood as a child, and I thought I was a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And now abides faith, hope, and Jesus. These three, but the greatest of these is Jesus. Amen. How does that sound tonight when you read it that way? Good. Amen. Because I think when we look at love, looking at knowing that God is love, and he that knoweth God, amen, well, he knows love. And he that knoweth not God, the word of God says that to that man or woman, they don't know love. And so Jesus is the proof of love, and he is the example of love, and he is love in its purest form. Just to uh, look a, a little bit, we started uh, talking last week, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Let me put a little bit of a, uh, a, little bit of a notation here. If you weren't here Sunday morning, uh, uh, I thank God for my wife, because sometimes my mind and my tongue doesn't work well together. And so I said that last Tuesday night, you know, that angel just came and spoke to them in English. Well, the angel didn't speak to them in English, Mary and Joseph, because that, they, they would have shook their head, scratched their head, and wondered what, right? And so, I don't know if anyone else caught it, it was kind of humorous, but, but uh, 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 we know that that angel, when it came to speak to Mary, he came to speak to Mary and Joseph, he spoke to them in uh, uh, an Aramaic, uh, Aramaic, probably a Palestinian Aramaic, probably a dialect that was more... Uh, 
uh, native to the Galilean area, uh, though uh, uh, Aramaic was that in Jerusalem, but, but it would be a dialect that was more native to their area. And so, uh, so and though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, he says, and so there are several things and ways that folks could uh, uh, look at that. Uh, we know this. In the Greek, it actually says, if it were possible to speak with uh, the tongues of men and angels, uh, is, is how it's actually written. It's, it's interesting, even as we study this and uh, the King James interpretation, uh, I, I found some things very interesting as I read about that. Uh, but, but though I speak with eloquence, if I speak in tongues, and he certainly, Paul is not uh, uh, negating tongues, he is certainly not uh, uh, putting it as a lesser level because we read on over in the next chapter, in verse number 18, he said, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than y'all. So he wasn't doing away with tongues. He was simply saying, if I speak with an eloquent language or a heavenly language or angel tongue or men tongue, however it is, and I don't have love, he said, I'm just this sounding grass or this tinkling symbol. And so when, when he says that, he says this. He said, I want you uh, to think about how that uh, other religions there are, are in Korea. And they have wildness going on and that music going on. And you hear their beating and their clashing and their music. But you look and you see they have no love for God and they have no love for one another. It's just a bunch of noise. He also is saying that, not, not a symbol like we know over here, but if there was a gong, it's, it's hollow, it's empty. You, 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 you say you have a, 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 a love for God and you don't have a love for, for, for others. It's just empty. It's just hollow. So it's exemplified in our love toward God is our actions toward others as well. And so to know real love, we have to know God. And if we know God, we will, we will know real love. Thinking about Valentine's Day tomorrow, let's think about what love is here. Though it's translated, uh, uh, 85 times uh, love is translated, and 28 of them is uh, uh, translated into charity. Uh, this uh, Greek word, agape, uh, we find that it has different meanings uh, and, and the first would be not that love that is between a man and a woman that is an intimate, passionate love, or not a filial love, which is uh, the nearest and dearest to our heart, or not a storage, which is uh, an affection toward a child, but it's an agape love. A love that is unconquering, it's benevolent, it is full of goodwill, it, 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 it's a feeling uh, uh, of our heart, but it's more than a feeling of our heart. It is an attitude of our will that no matter how we're treated, in insult, and in injury, and in humility, we only seek the highest good of others even when they bring insult and injury upon us. Wow! I want you to think about that. That is no way that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart because the natural man doesn't want to respond in love towards someone who brings insult in. What's the natural man want to do? I want to get even. I want to bring insult and injury to them because they brought insult and injury to me. But Paul said it's not that type of love that God shows. But it's a deliberate effort with the help of God that seeks only the best for others when they seek the worst for us. Wow. That's love. That's the love of God. When others want the worst for us, we only seek the best for them. And the only way that we can have this is through the help of God because He enables us to be able to love others. <coughs> We talked about though I had to get the prophecy and understand all mysteries and have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. 
The word charity here doesn't mean to give as a charity. Like we may say, oh, so-and-so's house burnt down. Let's have a charity for them. We're going to have a chicken corn soup. And Sister Dot's going to make some of her delicious cinnamon rolls. And Sister Rachel's going to make some of her delicious cinnamon rolls. We're going to sell them and we're going to give charity to that person. It's, it's not something that's political. It's not something that, uh, that, 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 that is a philosophy of love. But it is a real, real love that we give to others the very best and want the best for them because Christ has changed our hearts. We can have all knowledge, college degrees. We can have faith that we can move mountains. But if we don't have love, the Bible says, we are nothing. He said, uh, 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 and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body to be burned, and I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. We don't do love out of duty. It's easy when someone says, I'm in need to throw a, really, how many in here would really hurt if you threw a 20 in an offering plate for someone to help them out? Sometimes we do it out of duty, not because we really love that person, but because it's duty. And, and the word of God says, let every man uh, according as he purposed in his heart. So let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. But to be able to give love because we love like Christ has loved us. The Bible says that charity suffereth long and is kind. And charity envieth not, vaunt not itself, it's not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her, uh, her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Let's look at this a little, little bit. So suffering, when we look at this, charity suffereth long. You may say, so, so, some guy may say, man, I've been married to her for 50 years, and it's been a long 50 suffering years. Well, bless your miserable heart. That's not the suffering that God is talking about. And you may say, boy, I've really had to endure a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. But God, that's not even what God's talking about, about love suffering. Serving God will not always be easy. There's going to be difficult times. Those are faith builders. And, uh, uh, but we know that really suffer long means not to lose heart, to preserve patiently and bravely, endure trouble and misfortune, to be slow to punish, slow to anger, to demonstrate self-restraint when provoked. You see... When we see an injustice or maybe even injustice toward us or someone do something wrongly to us, love is this. It suffers long. I was thinking about this. You know, we can sometimes think about this in the natural. Someone was sharing with me about how a child who really doesn't care for all. He gave me a list of various things. And uh, I, I looked at that person and I said, so... You, what if that child showed up at their parents' house? How do you think that would? They said, they'd probably grab them and hug them and walk them in. You know why? Because as parents, you love your kids unconditionally. But a greater love is the love that God has for us. He's slow and he's patient with us. Do you ever think about when the Lord was drawing you and moving you to salvation? Maybe you were still living sinful and you were doing things that admired the holiness of God. But the love of God was patient and long-suffering with you. How about after you got saved? What's, what, Joel, what's his name? I forget his name. Uh, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Uh, there really ought to be a sign on my heart. Don't judge him yet. There's an unfinished part. You know, Joe Hempel wrote that, right? And how true it is, God is still working on us. Why is He working on us? Because His love is most. And God wants our love to be that way with others. We talked about last week, who was long-suffering? David was long-suffering. He could have done Saul, and Saul did wrong. But David said, that's not mine. I won't do it. 
We think about not only Saul, but we think about in the Word of God uh, as well. Uh, Joseph, he was done wrong. Uh, but, but we find that these individuals were long-suffering. The Word of God says that love is pleasant or love is kind. It means to show oneself mild, to be kind. It's the opposite of harsh. Love is patient and waits when, when, when it's even mistreated. I'm not talking about being walked over. I'm talking about being patient with others and loving one another uh, because uh, it's keeping our cool because we love. And our life should be marked by that. Tender thoughts. So let's, let's move on. Tonight's fresh. The Bible says that, uh, that love doesn't envy. It envies not. It doesn't want that which belongs to others. And that word envy means this. It means... Uh, uh, to be heated or to boil with envy, hatred, jealousy, coveting uh, what God has given to someone else. Have you ever met someone that's jealous of someone else's position? That's not love. Or uh, someone who's jealous of what someone else attained to with their possessions, the accolades, the attention, the popularity, the, pay, the praise that they get. If you were to look at the Word of God, does anyone come to mind who maybe you can say, man, they weren't loved, but people were jealous and envious of what they had? Anyone? Who do you think of in Scripture? Saul. Saul? Yeah, that was Paul. Explain more to me. Well, uh, how he went out and did things now. When they found out where he was at, they came after him, you know, and tried to serve other people. So Saul, he was hated. Paul. Someone else in Scripture. I have two people I'm really thinking of. Joseph. Absolutely. Go ahead. I'll let you. Well, first of all, go to the first hours. Reuben was the first one. Reuben was the first one. Out of all the children, but he was the uh, Joseph was the firstborn of Rachel because she was the one that he loved. And because of that, uh, his father Jacob gave him the covenant colors. The covenant colors indicated that he would have been the next head of the family instead of Reuben. And that placed him above in the social status as a religious leader, and they hated him for that. Among that, he told him about his dream where they all bowed down before him. They did not like the idea of bowing down before Joseph. Because of that, they saw him in slavery. How do you think they felt to him? What was that feeling? Did you say that? Hatred, anger. Yeah, I think very much so. Jealousy because he was his father's favorite. Jealousy leads to that anger, that hatred, right? And so they hated him. So yeah, very much in Scripture we find that, you know, really when you do it God's way, though it may not have been uh, the way that man thought that it should be, uh, but, but what we find in his brother, they were uh, happy for Joseph and his dream and where he was, but they were very jealous. And so the very opposite of God's... How about someone else in Scripture? How about a man who's a prophet? We like to read about him because he's prophetic even today. And, and what he did, and then he, that's Hannah and Hammer Revelation. No? He's carried away captive. Daniel. Daniel. So how, what do you think about Daniel? What did his colleagues think of him? They were jealous because he was favored by the Lord and by the king of And the king's out of to be wiser than all of the others. Because um, Daniel was a prophet because his wisdom didn't come from God. Uh, but when he was elevated to a higher position, Absolutely. So here's two examples of Scripture. They plotted against him. They wanted to kill him. I mean, that was their plot. They wanted to get rid of him. They let him get ate by the lions. Let, let's be done with him. I'm, I'm tired of him. Carried away captive. He shouldn't be honored. His position, his growth, where he's at. He, and so his colleagues, 
They, they really uh, 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 did not love him at all. They conspired against him. Uh, how about even in the Old Testament, we find two brothers, and I think their example, really they should have had brotherly love, but there was great jealousy, and it did not end well. You know what I'm talking about? Cain and Abel. Absolutely. And when we look at uh, Abel's blood cried from the ground to the Lord because his brother Cain was jealous of him. And so it shouldn't have been this way. God really wanted there to be love there. And so we see what happens uh, by biblical examples when we don't rejoice with the accolades of others, when others are applauded or they're given position, or when there's not real love that comes from God. It can lead to a very bad situation. And so uh, the Word of God says here that love does not envy. But James said it this way, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Uh, for where uh, there is envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. So real love doesn't envy. So on every level that we think that love needs to be in our life, really in the workplace, we need to love where God has placed us, our co-workers, those who are parallel to us, those who are above us, whatever happens, those folks in our family, even our siblings, our parents, our cousins, those in our community, and we, should, we should be marked by loving people, not being envious. The Bible not only says that love doesn't envy, but it vaunts not. It's never a braggart. Uh, uh, vaunt means to display or extol yourself. It means uh, to focus on yourself more than focusing on others. Uh, I, I think this... I wrote myself a note here. Let me see what I'm... Did you ever notice just the way that God made our bodies. Did He make our bodies to make a little pat ourselves on the back? He never really makes us to kick ourselves either, right? So there's a couple lessons to be learned. But when we look at what, what love is, it doesn't display or extol itself. But it looks for the well-being of others. It's really not about what we can do. But how can we serve? And how can we care? Um, I read a, an illustration that was pretty good. It was about a man who, uh, who had bought a foreign car. And he was bragging to his friends about how well that this car got great gas mileage. So his friends snuck in his parking lot one night, Brother Eli, and they decided they'd play a little trick on him, and so they dumped some extra gallons of gasoline in there. So he was really thinking he was getting a lot of mileage per hour. So he's bragging to everyone, it seemed unrealistic and unreal, until one day they stopped dumping the gasoline in there, and guess what? He ate humble pie. <laughs> See, his bubble got popped. It's not about bragging and about who we are, but love is about serving others. The very Son of God, He came to serve. He came to love. Even as He loved us with the cross. Even as He loved us in death, He came to serve. So it's interesting, the Word of God says that that it, 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 it vaunts not itself. So it's being a braggart. But then it says, is not puffed up. So what's the difference between being a braggart and being puffed up? So it's not being prideful. In fact, the very word puffed up, when translated, it translates to this. It translates to being a <coughs> man. Bag. <coughs> Did you ever hear someone say, well, they're a wind 
bad. <coughs> it means that they implode, they blow up, they cause to swell, they make proud. Love doesn't have a swelled head, it's not exaggerated, it doesn't seek its own importance. And so here's the problem in Corinth, that the, the Holy Ghost is moving and, and they're grateful for what the Spirit of God is doing, but they almost like they want to own it and they're puffed up by it. Paul said this to him. He said, you know, don't pat yourself on the back. You weren't designed to do that. But understand that you need to serve. And love is not puffed up. There was a story of a, of, of a uh, mediator and he was uh, working with the bull, Brother Doug, uh, he got the bull and he got a sword and uh, got the bull down and he took the sword to the bull and, and uh, it appeared the bull was dead. Brother Justin, he stood up to the crowd, the mediator, he was so proud of what he did and all of a sudden what he didn't realize is that the bull was not dead. And it jumped up and in its rage took its horn and put through him and pierced his heart and killed him. Pride will kill us. And if that's part of how we serve and how we love, it's contrary to the love of God. Real love that brings service brings life. But love that is puffed up brings death. The Word of God goes on now to say not only is it not puffed up, but it does not behave itself unseemingly. You see, it's, it, uh, it is forgetful and it, 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 of, of self and it thinks <coughs> of others. It's not crude, it's not rude, it's characterized by good behaviors, by politeness, uh, how, how we treat others. The Word of God uh, talks about that uh, let me find myself here a minute. Does not behave itself unseemly and seeks not her own. It doesn't seek the needs of self, but it seeks the needs of others. I read this story as I was studying of a woman who was in a country and she was dying. The missionary wrote the story how that. He was there, he was passing out sweet potatoes to folks in the middle of a famine. He came across a young woman who was lying on the ground, and you could see that she was dying, and she was holding her baby brother Dennis, and he gave her a cooked sweet potato, and he said he watched that woman as she took that sweet potato, and she began to eat it, and she chewed it, and she got it warm, and all of a sudden, she put it from her mouth over into her baby's mouth so that the food would be chewed and it would be warm and that baby would take in. She took that entire sweet potato, Brother Justin, and she did that to her child. The next day, he said, that woman, her heart stopped and she died, but the child lived and continued to live. You see, love doesn't seek its own, but it seeks the best interest of those round about us. Love, it points on others. It makes sense sacrifice and it will give up one's own life so that others may have good life. Amen. That's real love. I remember when I was a little boy, one of the, one of the memories that I have of, of, of a, a church service, there was an older man and he was old when I was a little boy and I remember him telling the story. We lived uh, uh, up this dirt road and folks that have ever been in West Virginia think the road are bad, is bad now, but where we where I was initially born, we came up this Piedmont mountain and literally it was this dirt road and it was just on the side of the mountain, Brother Doug. And I mean, it just plummeted off. How people ever lived that way, I would never live that way. I, 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 just, yes, absolutely crazy. And it, it was the winter, but and you had to commute. I mean, and, and, and it was a dirt road and it didn't get clean well. You know how that is. And, and this man said that he remembered a time when my mom and dad were traveling down this road and it got really bad for the Justin and the drivers were working. And so in, in the middle of a cold winter, not terribly cold, but snow, 
He said, my mom got out of the vehicle and walked the whole road all the way home with my brother bundled up in her arms because she wanted to protect him from potential danger. That's amazing. That's what love does. It protects others from potential danger or harm. It doesn't seek its own, but it seeks the well-being of others. Let me ask you, everything that we've looked at between last Tuesday night and tonight, how are you doing in comparison with God's standard of love? How are you doing? The Word of God says that love is not easily provoked. Now, I found this very interesting. I read this from two commentators. You can research it and do whatever you want. But actually, they said that word easily is not really in the, the translation. But those translating the King James put that there because King James could easily be provoked. And so they were trying to soften it. And so it would breed more like love is not provoked. Love is not provoked. It is not embittered by abuse or insult or injury. It doesn't get aroused when things go wrong. It doesn't allow itself to be burned or irritated. It, it, it's not touchy. And so for us to understand love, anger cannot be a motivating factor for injustices when we really love the way that God requires us to love. It refuses to get provoked at the wrong action. Wow. 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 How is that for you? Are we loving the way God wants us to love that we don't get provoked at a wrong action? We don't become uh, bitter. We, we don't nurse a bitter heart. We're not touchy. The Word of God goes on down to say that love thinks no evil. The word thinketh here is kind of like uh, an accountant, Brother, Brother Eli, where they keep books and they keep records of everything. So, Brother Justin, that means that uh, that love, it doesn't keep an account of all the wrongdoings. Do you ever feel like sometimes you ever been around someone and they remember every mistake you ever made in your life? I can own my mistakes, but I don't, I don't need to be reminded of them every day, especially if I've made them right and I put them beneath the blood and, and my life has, has, has moved. And, and, and have you ever found folks like that? I mean, I think even the news media, they like to dig up dirt on people, don't they? But, but, but the real love of God doesn't keep an account of wrongs for any of us. In such a way that it keeps an account that when the occasion is right, when we're hurt or we're offended, then we don't take out. God doesn't do that. It's beneath the blood. Love doesn't keep a record that can bring it up at just the right time. But love says, I don't want to hurt you as much as you hurt me. I wonder how many homes, if they bring that in, husbands and wives, parents and children, siblings, if they would bring that in, how much unity there would be if we love the way that God loves. Now let me bring you there a little closer to home. I wonder how much more in harmony the church would be if we didn't keep record of things to bring up when we're hurt. It's interesting. True story. A woman came to a lawyer and she said to the lawyer, she said, I 
cannot stand my husband and I want a divorce from him. She said, but before I divorce him, I want to hurt him so bad. So the divorce lawyer looked at her and he said, I'll tell you what, you want to hurt him? You go home and you love on him. You do everything you can do to bless him and encourage him. And then when you divorce him, it will get straight to his heart. I think we ought to do the rest of the story. Don't we? The lawyer approached the woman two months later. He said, are you ready? Are you ready to hurt? No, I don't want a divorce. I love him. I love him. I want to stay with him. You see, because she got rid of her pile of offenses, and it changed her marriage. If we get rid of our piles of offenses, it will change our relationship. Loving the way God wants us to love. The Bible goes on down to say, does not behave itself uh, unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoiceth in iniquity, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. See, real love doesn't rejoice in injustices or in filth, perversion, dirty stories. And I'm not talking about dirty stories as being off color. I'm talking about dirty stories that bring out the worst of other people. It doesn't find rejoicing and happiness in that. But all oh, when people grab hold of the truth. Well, sometimes the truth may not be what we like, but we believe others can overcome it through the grace of God because He loves them. Love is pleased with the truth. Paul said this, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of the suffering be made conformable unto his death, rejoicing and pleased with the truth. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day, David said. Do you know why? Because he loved truth. When we love God, we'll love the truth of his word, and it will take precedence over everything else in our life. And we'll make it applicable for our relationship with Him and our relationship with others. The Bible says that love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things. You see, that beareth all things, it means this. It means to cover, to protect, to put a roof over something. So love, it protects others. It doesn't seek revenge. It doesn't seek evil. It doesn't seek hurt. But it brings protection to others. Wow. That is a powerful type of love. You know, it's easy for us probably with our children, if you're a parent, you, know, you want to protect your children. I do. I know probably that helped out for dad. I don't want anything to hurt them. I, I love them. I protect them. I, I don't like to see them hurt or in pain. There's, but God's love toward us is that way. But God not only requires that for us and our children, but God requires that for us in every other relationship that we have. That we seek protection and safety for others. And so that means wanting the best for others. Love not only bears all things, but it believes all things. You know, did you ever just give someone the benefit of the doubt? That's what it is. Give them the benefit of the doubt. 
Isn't it amazing how when we get older, we learn that there's two sides to every story and that we don't believe anything we hear and only half of what we see, so we have to give folks the benefit of the doubt? That's what real love does. It gives the benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying love is gullible, and I'm not saying that love is blind and accepts uh, everything that, 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 that is told, but it's simply this. We're not quick to condemn. Was Christ quick to condemn us? Our own hearts condemn us. He convicts us and draws us to salvation. But God's love is not condemning love. God's love is a saving love. It is perfect, brother. The Bible says that it it believes all things. It hopes all things. It is hopeful. So in spite of all the trials, in spite of all the difficulties, listen, I'm going to say something tonight. I don't know who here, you may have had some trials, you may have had some difficulties, but love still hopes for a reconciliation and a good relationship. Because that's the love of God. And love, it draws strength from that hope. Love endures all things. It will never fail. In fact, when it says, uh, love faileth not, did you ever see someone that maybe would be performing on stage and you hear the crowd, Boom! Throwing right to me. Love don't go away with that. But love endures. I gotta be honest. I love a good challenge of when someone's being beaten, crying. It's a good challenge. The older I get, the more I'm challenged by it. Because I think it's an opportunity for us to show the love of God. Real love does not fail. It never fails. It endures. It means it remains under the low. It's brave in its calm, even in the face of ill treatment. I want to share one more story in closing, and then I'll let you share anything that you'd like to share. True story of a lady who called cab driver. And uh, it was at the end of the shift, and he was ready to get the route done and get home. I know that feeling. I know that feeling when it's at the end of my work day, and lots of people show up. I like to get home. Most of the time, I'm put in my place, and God teaches me a lesson. But here was this cab driver, and he was wanting to get home, and he had the door right there in New York City, Brother Doug, and the, the lady didn't come out, Sister Beth. And so he honked the horn again, she didn't show up. So he went to the door, and he knocked on the door. The door opened, there was a feeble little old lady. He could see in the background that this house that she lived in looked like it had been abandoned. There wasn't knickknacks, there wasn't a lot of things, but adjusting. And what furniture was there had sheets over top of that. She came dragging her, her luggage to the door. She said, would you be able to carry this for me? The cab driver related how that he carried that luggage. And, and so uh, he said, ma'am, where are you going when they got in the car? He plugged in the address. And she said, but could you, but could you take a longer route? But ma'am, it's the end of my shift. She said, would you please just take the longer route? I like to see the city. I like to see the city. He said in that moment, he turned off his meter. He began to drive her around the city. They began to engage in conversation. And uh, uh, they, they shared of things past. And before he knew it, several hours had passed by. When they pulled up to the final destination, she said, this will be the end for me. 
this is the hospice house that I would die in. The doctor tells me I don't have much more time and I have no more family. The taxi driver related how that in that moment he was glad that he turned the needle off and he engaged in the present. She said, how much do I owe you? He said, you don't owe me anything because you owe me. You see, real love will drop the extra mile. Real love will listen. Real love will not judge when we don't know all the details, but it will believe the best. And in the end, real love, it wins. We are home because we love it. I've got a a little faster because I want to wrap up. I told you I'd try to do it. Anybody have anything that you want to say about love and what the Word of God says about love? Yeah. Yeah. Solomon said, Many waters cannot quench love and floods. I believe that if we really allow the love of God to be shed abroad in our hearts, nothing will quench that love. I believe our marriages should be strong because we know what love is. It doesn't seek. I was trying to find some funny quotes, and I really couldn't find any because they were mostly perverted, as I Googled it. But some things that I read was, um, love is a free thing until you get married. Really? Love is a wonderful thing. It's a free thing when you do it God's way and you're married. That's God's way. Someone said marriage is blind, but uh, love, love is blind, but marriage is the eye opener. No, I disagree. Because when we allow God to be the root and the center of our marriage, it's a blind. working on nine years. It's been great. Seems like yesterday in a lot of ways. Go ahead, Brad. Go to Doug's. how many years? 33. 33. And the answer is yes when I ask you this question. Does it seem like just yesterday at times? I do it all the time. Amen. It's not perfect. You know, we have our ups and downs, and it's not all butterflies in the belly. If we get butterflies in our bellies, do butterflies eat humans and theirs? <laughs> but it's a real commitment. It's a real beauty because we can see God. So I just want to take a time out of these couple weeks to get ready for Valentine's Day. So we'll get real love. Real love. It's in our marriages. It's in our family. It's everyone that we come in contact with because we love them the way that Christ loved us. If we look at every person, sister God, we look at them the way God looks at them. And we give them a smile and we give love. Someone on the <coughs> sorry. I'm taking more time than I intended. Someone have anything that you want to share tonight? saying is, it's a wonderful feeling to feel loved. Right. I like that. 
I like to feel loved. I like when people like me. No, I I'm not gonna lie to you. No, my idea. I like it or not. But you know, the greater thing is you showing it to them. That's right. The greater thing is not that I feel loved, but that I get loved. Because if you yell back at the person, all it says is make things work and work. That's right. That's right. Anybody else? Thoughts? Mr. Rachel? Like we have been in 4 8, it says, I need red, and what sort of things are true, what sort of things are honest, what sort of things are just, what sort of things are pure, what sort of things are lovely, what sort of things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And knowing that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, if that is our focus mentally, If not, let's stand. And let's say one final thing. We can be angry and sin not. You know, we can't get angry over um, sin. We should. Jesus was upset at the money changers, but he sinned not. You see, love doesn't mean that we're wishy washy and we don't stand for what's right, but it means we do it. So I just want to, I want to throw that in there. I didn't want you to think that everything about love is all, you know, um, passive. It doesn't 